Well, good morning. It is great to see you. It's great to be with you. It's great to have you join us online. Shout out to all those who are all over uh, joining us today, including the Back 40. I know you guys are there as well. It's just good to be together. You know, we're in this, uh, we're, we're starting this series called Four, just three letters, and yet there are three powerful letters. I, I first learned about Four from a guy named Art. Art was my first boss right out of school, and uh, like he took me under his wing, and he took he started to teach me things. He saw things in me, and so he began to draw them out, and he didn't owe me anything. Like, it's not like I had done something for him, but he just started to pour into me, and Art taught me some professional skills, some personal skills that, frankly, I just didn't have. He began to teach me how to, to, to build the craft of sales and marketing, he, he, he took me to uh, uh, and gave me opportunities to go to these training seminars and conferences and, and opportunities that I probably wouldn't have got invited to unless he had gone to bat for me. Early on, he, he got me a raise and a, and a promotion. I mean, he's just, Art was there, and he was for me. And there were times when he spoke into my, my work. You know, it wasn't up to standard. It wasn't where it should be. But you know what? Because Art was for me, and I knew that, I accepted it. I was good with it. I, I, I knew he had me and my, my heart. He had my life in his best interest. And there was something about that. And so I let Art speak into me. I probably look like Art more than anybody else in the world professionally. And I would say he, he, was, he was a man of character too. And so I, I learned so much from him. And I received it all because he was for me. There's something about those three letters. That's why at the Valley, we want to be known by who we are for and not what we're against. Because when you're for people, people are drawn. When you're against things, it pushes people away. And God has given us a mission to the world. And what I've discovered is that the way this mission is best carried out is by being for people by being arts in the world. Jesus' own words said this. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's the mission. We're to go out and partner with Jesus to mold people. We're to go be a partner with Jesus. Reminds me of the guy they interviewed <laughs> with, uh, he, he, was, he was playing on the Bulls with Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan had just splashed 69 points, and he had scored one, and they were in the locker room with him at the end. They said, what? wow, this was just a tremendous display. What's the thing that you're going to remember most about this night? And the guy said, I'm going to remember this was the night me and Michael Jordan combined for 70 points. <laughs> that, that's the kind of partnership this is. <laughs> And, and yet, we do have a part. We have a point. Like, it says, go make disciples. And I, and I think a lot of people want to push the make aside. It's like, well, but, but that's all God. We can't do anything about it. Not true. See, God has given you and me a part in partnering with him. And yes, God is the almighty God. He's the one that moves people's heart. We can't do that. But he uses us to make disciples. That, that's an active, go out and make it happen with God's power. You can't do it on your own, but God chooses not to do it on his own. He chooses to use you and me. And, and the best way for you and I to accomplish that, I'm convinced, I've seen it in my own life, I've seen it in other people's lives, is to be for people. Because you know when you're for someone, when somebody is for you, you listen to them. When I've discovered, and, and the, I've discovered this truism in my life, you've probably discovered it in yours, we don't listen to people who aren't for us. Like our sense, our radar picks up really quick on that, and we don't really listen to them. We don't follow them. We don't, we don't digest what they say. We don't let them influence us. But when we know somebody is for us, that doesn't mean... They, they overlook our weaknesses or, or they don't help us grow. No, it means that they want our best. When we have people like that in our life, we listen to them. 
because we know ultimately they're going to make us better. And so in this four-week series, we're going to look at how to be for people and more focused on what we're for than what we're against. Now, some would say, well, Pastor Andy, does that mean that we don't ever take a stand? No. You see, necessarily when you're for something, it's, it's clear that, that there are other things that you are not for. But I'd much rather lead with what I'm for than what I'm against. Because for draws all people together. Against pushes people away. So, so today we're going to talk about extreme makeovers. That's one thing that God is for. God's for an extreme makeover in your life. Did you know that? And God's for extreme makeovers in other people's lives. I love extreme makeovers. One of the things I do on vacation or just when I have a day off, sometimes I'll go get my bike and I'll ride downtown. I'll get a coffee. Yes, I don't drink the coffee at the shop. I, I get back on my bike and I take my coffee around town. And you know what I do? I go look at projects. I go look at building projects. Uh, lately, I've been, uh, you know, I'll get off my bike, I'll wander around, just act like I know what I'm doing, and, and I'll get to see the project. I've been down to the new beanery at Winans before it opened. There's a new restaurant going up. I was in there when they were putting equipment in. I, I've seen the entrepreneurial center that's going up, and have you noticed there's a YMCA going up? Like, that thing is taking off. I'm from Rushi. That feels so big city to me. I've sat there just like a little boy and watched the crane lift up the stuff. I love extreme makeovers. My family said I was, I was at the hotel when they were remodeling that, rebuilding that, renovating that. I was there more than the construction supervisor. I don't know. I just I love seeing when they take a space and they transform it. Now, this can be really dangerous, though. We've been watching these H HGTV shows and they do complete renos. Like, they start over. It's pretty extreme, and it can get in your blood. Over COVID, it got in our blood. We started tearing walls down. Like, first, we took a bedroom out that was part of our family room, and then we took the wall between the family room and the kitchen. All of a sudden, it was wide open and a mess. And, uh, you know, one of the things they don't show you on those, like, they do the reno days or the, the, the demo days, and they tear it all up, and the personalities are up there tearing everything. What they don't show you is off camera the army that's going to come in when this ceases to be fun. And uh, <laughs> so we tore it down. Fortunately, we did have uh, some help, and, and we got there. But I love extreme makeovers, and so does God. He wants to do extreme makeovers in our lives. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2 with me. Would you do that? This, I, I love the book of Acts because it's like, there's a lot of action. You don't have to sit around, okay? Acts chapter 2. By the way, if you've got the Valley app, you can go. The message notes are there. All the scriptures, the passages for today. Pull out your Bible. That'd be great. Underline, highlight. This is going to be, I love what God wants to say to us today. He's got a message for us. He's got a word for us if you're ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, Acts chapter 2, Paul's preaching to the early church. Pentecost has happened. Jesus has already died. He's been resurrected. And the gift of the Holy Spirit has been given to the church. And the Jewish people have rejected Jesus. And so now Peter's preaching to them. And look what he says to them. He says, it's time for an extreme makeover in your life. So you've been relying on status quo. You've been relying on religion. You've been relying on a lot of things, but no, it's time for an extreme makeover. It's time to let Jesus Christ into your life and the Holy Spirit and change who you are. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. That's you and me. Like, he's saying the gift is for those who are to come and the generations to come. All those who hear this message, it's for you, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And the promise that Peter is preaching about is that Jesus will come and forgive you. He'll release you of your guilt and shame. He'll remove from you the sin that you deserve to, to, to stay under, to bear, and he'll take it away. And yet, there's, a greater, there, there's another promise with that. I don't know if there's a greater promise, but it's tied with that, that not only will he take your sin away, 
but he will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is God inside of you so that as you do this journey, as you walk with God, as you are a follower of Jesus, he'll give you the power of God inside you to stay focused on him, to do the things that he calls you to do, to live the life that he's calling you to, which is a high calling as a, as a child of God. And he's going to fill you with love. Almighty God, who is the author of peace, shalom, complete with sense of well-being, he's going to live inside of you. He's going to guide and empower you. But here's what I think Peter is saying. You either have to let God do an extreme makeover or it doesn't work. See, we can't do these half measures. Hear me today. We, we, have, to, we have to let God do an extreme makeover make over in our life or we'll miss out on his promises here it is oh, I think it went past where I was I, I, wanna, I want this, oh there it is I, I think, I hear this a lot well, I believe in God I, I, I believe he exists believing that God exists isn't enough going to church all by itself is a great thing but it's not enough See, Peter says there has to be a, an extreme makeover in your life. You've got to change who you identify with. You've got to change the trajectory of your life. You've got to change who is king inside of your heart. And he says, repent and be baptized. Repentance is this change of mind is probably the best way to, def to, to share the term that's used there. It's a 180-degree turn. It's an about face. You're going in one direction. You turn in another. Baptism is about identity. Baptism doesn't save us, but it does reveal who, whose we are. We're going to have a baptism, by the way, October 9th. If you've said yes to Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in him, you begin following him, baptism is your next step of obedience. Put it on the Connect card. Come see us. You can grab a card off the next step wall. Take that step. Because that's part of being all in. That's part of what Peter is talking about here today. And some of you have been holding back. Oh, I don't know if I want to go public about that. I don't know if I should, like, God is calling you to be all in. He's calling you to an extreme makeover. When I was in the military, went to basic training, then advanced training. Like, I was a combat engineer, 12B. We blew things up. We built bridges. Uh, when I later became 19 kilo, which is a tank. Uh, tank guy, um, M1 tank, and when we went to those, like, when we were done with the training, and, and we became a combat engineer, not, not wannabe, but we were, they gave us a patch, and the patch signified who we were, and the whole rest of the military knew that guy's a combat engineer, this is what he does, this is who he is, this is his people. We can only have one patch at a time. You're either in the world, or you have a patch. You have a patch in your heart that says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm all in. Like you can't identify with this group and that group and that group. No, you're to identify with Jesus Christ as his, his being your savior, filled with the spirit. And Peter says, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to stop trusting in the law. The law won't save you. Jesus Christ has come to fulfill the law, and are you going to trust in Jesus? Are you going to let him forgive you? And then are you going to let him give you the gift of the Holy Spirit so you can live this life that I've called you to? That's an extreme makeover, because here's what happens when, when you begin to follow Jesus, and that's what it says. I love, I love what, it, what it, in, in the New Testament, it talks about this, this decision to receive Jesus into our life. It says, come, follow me. Jesus says that all the time, come. Follow me. When you begin to take a step toward Jesus, you're taking a step away from the world. And you begin to follow him. You begin to do what he does. You walk in the steps of the rabbi and you begin to learn and grow. And with Pentecost, the Old Testament is superseded by the New Testament. In the New Testament times, in these new days, the new covenant with Jesus, he says, I'm not only died for you, but now I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit in you. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, the Holy Spirit comes to take residence in your life. He doesn't come to be a spectator. Well, when I need you, I'll call on you. Just stay quiet. That's what we do a lot. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he wants to change the furniture of our life. When Paul and I first got married, um, 
We didn't have much, but we had a few things, you know, and so we started to rearrange the furniture in our new house. Uh, it was an old house, but it was new to us. And I remember, I don't know if you could call it furniture, our first TV stand was a cardboard box with a doily on it. That kind of that made it look fancy. That, that's where we were at. <laughs> And I remember we, like, we had arranged it all just the way we liked it, just the way we wanted it. And then I went off to work. I came back, and the furniture was moved. I don't know who did it. Next day, you know, so that night, I kind of moved it back and subtly. And then the next day, I went to work. I come back, and the furniture was moved again. <laughs> I guess we didn't have, have it the way we liked it. <laughs> That's what we do with the Holy Spirit. See, when we come to Jesus and when we begin to receive him, we begin to follow him and walk in his footsteps. He gives us the gift of this, the spirit. But we now have to decide, are we going to still continue to run our life or are we going to put the Holy Spirit on the throne of our heart? Are we going to let him rearrange the furniture or are we going to move it back? And for too long in my life, I moved it back. I'm like, you know, they're going to think I'm radical. They're going to think they're going to think I've, I've drank the Kool-Aid. Like, I, I, I can't go that far. My friends are going to ditch me on this one. You know, I, that, that's just too Give my money? We aren't making it now. And it was, it was those kind of thinking. Like, the Holy Spirit wanted me to take spiritual steps, and I said, no, I don't know, and I resisted. So just know this radical life that God is calling you to isn't, ah, forgive my sins, got some insurance, I'm not, you know, I, I'm going to heaven now. It's way greater than that. Say this with me. God is for me. Say it with me. God is for me. He's for you. He wants way more than that. Because that's like down here kind of living. And God wants you up here kind of living. And that means letting the Holy Spirit rearrange the furniture of your life. Because I wouldn't be a pastor today if I hadn't let him rearrange my life. I had other plans. Um, when we got married, I had no idea I'd be a pastor. And it's not something I would have picked, in all honesty. It's a call I answered, but it's not something I would have picked. There are a lot of things in my life I wouldn't have picked. Some of the things that God has called me to do. And, and, and I'm like, God, do you know what you're doing? Have you ever been there? That, that's and Peter says, no, I'm calling you to an extreme makeover here. Repent and be baptized. You're now identifying with Jesus Christ. You're identifying as part of a body of believers now. That's who you are. That's what you do. And you let the Holy Spirit work in your life. You put him on the throne of your heart. And when he rearranges the furniture, you let him. You trust him because you know that he is for you and he wants your best see god didn't call you to live down here he called you to live up here where are you living today where are you living today down here or up here are you wearing the patch of jesus christ are, are you wearing the patch that says i belong to jesus i allow the holy spirit to to live on the throne of my heart and to do whatever he calls me to do i i I trust him. I'm an active part of what he is doing in this world. Or are we still hanging on to making the changes to the furniture ourselves? Because only when you allow God to change your life, to, to do the extreme things, will you live your best life. And come on, if we're really honest, was our old self all that great? Were we doing okay on our own? I always like what Dr. Phil said. How's that working for you? No, I don't watch Dr. Phil, but I know the phrase. <laughs> An extreme makeover is God being for us because he has a whole lot more than you've allowed. And here's the thing. What I've discovered in life is that when we allow extreme makeovers in our life, God can use us to do great things in other people's lives. I love what he says Paul tells the church in Rome, he says, those led by the Spirit of God are the children of God with all the rights and the privileges and the joys of being a child of the Almighty God who's perfect in love, complete, who has great purpose, who, who is eternal. Like there, has to, there is no fear. 
And I want you to know today, some of you, I, I don't know that this has ever sunk in to you. Maybe you need to hear that today. I want you to know God is for you. He's for you. So let him speak into your life. Let him rearrange the furniture. He doesn't want to mess it up. He doesn't want to take your fun away. He wants to give you purpose and meaning and significance. Will you let him? God is for you. Now some of you are saying, Pastor Andy, what does that look like in real life? What does that look like in a practical sense? I'm glad you asked. It, it, just a few verses down, we begin to look at what the early church looks like and we get a snapshot. This is kind of like, you know, you take those photos on vacation or you take those photos in a, in a moment in time. That's kind of what this is. I think it, it's not a prescription for all of us exactly how to do it, but it's a description of what the church ought to look like when we've had st extreme makeovers. This is what the church ought to look like. It starts in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. It said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Devoted. That means all in. Just, that's the translation. Like they were committed. That was, like, it wasn't a, well, once I hear all this stuff, let's, you know, once I, maybe I'll decide then. No, this was a, whatever it is, whatever you show us, God, I'm this is my life. This is how I identify. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers, all. Like if you're a believer, you're in. You, you aren't a believer in running your own show. You aren't a believer in doing your own thing. You aren't a believer in riding by yourself. You know, you gotta, you're always taking somebody with you. You're always part of a group. You're always part of other believers and living in their life and them living in yours. All the believers were together and had everything in common. It wasn't about their preferences. <laughs> it wasn't about what they wanted. It was about what was good for the mission, what was good for the body. It said they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Like, like the church was held in high esteem. Like, it was almost like they were on display. Did you know you're on display? That, that how you live day in and day out, people are watching. They're watching the conversation on Facebook. Can, can I say that again? They're watching the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter between followers of Christ. They're watching. You're on display. Is it about you? Is it about the common good? Is it about the mission of Jesus Christ? Or is it about what we're against? Are we leading with what we're for? It says, all, and the Lord... I love this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Like when it looks pretty. It really never looks pretty pretty. But you know what I'm saying. Like when they see the power in people's lives, when, when they see people loving each other and belonging to each other and experiencing the power of God in their life, people want that. They want to be part of that because you can't find that anywhere else in the world. You, you just can't find that anywhere else in the world. The thing is, that can't happen without the first extreme makeover, and that's in your life. See, that will never happen. That's why it doesn't happen in the world. Because unless there's a, an extreme makeover in your heart, and now you belong to Jesus Christ, unless you put the Holy Spirit in the throne of your heart and are devoted to the things of God, you're devoted to His way, living it out, and being part of something greater called the church, it ain't gonna happen. See, the next extreme makeover won't happen because people want to see it lived out. They want to see if it's real. So there's one extreme makeover that leads to another. And... Anybody re remember a comedian named Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy? Anybody remember him? He had a little routine. 
you might be a redneck if. Let's try a couple. You, you might be a redneck if you've ever cut your grass and found a car. You might be a redneck if you've ever been pulled over for speeding with a mattress tied to the top of your car. You might be a redneck if recipe for disaster reminds you of your wife's chili recipe. You might be a redneck if you get a coffee and go for a bike ride. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but here's, now, now let's take that and apply that to Acts chapter 2. You've had an extreme makeover if God's Word's your Bible. Bible in our vernacular today, in our, in our lingo, means that's the authority. Is God's Word your authority? It says the church was characterized by believers who devoted themselves to learning what the apostles said. The apostles were those who experienced the life of Jesus before he died and then they saw his death. They saw his resurrection. They were there for the whole thing, and they're the ones that are writing down the New Testament. And the early church, they're devoted to it, like it's the Bible. And it's the authority for them, not the influencer on TikTok, <laughs> not their friends, not their politics, nothing else. Their authority was God's word. Whatever it said to do, they did. However they needed to line up, even if they thought, God, what are you doing here? They did it anyway because they were already committed to that. Devoted means you're regularly in it, spending time letting God speak to you. They, they were in it. And they were characterized by doing whatever it said to do with abandon. You've had an extreme makeover when you're fully into God's bride, the church. I've heard people say this, I love Jesus. I don't like the church much. That's like, that's like telling a, somebody who just got engaged, man, I like you, but fiance, I don't think so. Th that's really what you're doing. And so today, if you say, well, I don't like organized religion, or I, I don't like the church, or like they hurt me there, <sighs> I get it. We're, we're human. I've been hurt. You've been hurt. If you're around the church long enough, you're all going to be hurt. Y'all you all going to be treated wrongly. It's just what happens. Because we're human. We're weak. That's not God's fault. In spite of that, God has never let you down. What did we just sing? Jonathan, first time on the praise team, thank you. Beautiful. God is faithful. He will never let you down. The church might but it's God's plan. It's his one plan to change the world, to, to, to share the gospel in the world. So you can get down on the church, but God says, no, that's my bride. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Jesus Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. That's me and you at our best and at our worst. And so if you've had an extreme makeover, you're part of the fellowship. Did you know the Greek word for fellowship? <laughs> Is, well, it's koinonia. It means togetherness. It means band of brothers kind of deal. And if you're not part of the band of brothers here, and I'll just tell you, I don't know how many we got here, you know, 250 here on a Sunday morning in this service and more in the kids and teens, but, you know, another service, and then you got Troy Camp. Like, there's just too many to be a band of brothers, all like all of us. Band of brothers is more like 810. It's a life group, just so you know. And if you're not part of a band of brothers, if you're not experiencing life with other believers, you're missing what God's called you to do. So get in a group today. There's plenty of them out there. And, and, and take that step. I know it's hard sometimes. You're like, I don't, they don't know me. I don't know them. That's the point, is that we begin to discover each other. We do the hard work, and that's when we discover what God wants to do in our life. We're part of the extreme makeover when when we break bread together. When we break bread together. It says you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. Each one of you is a part of it. See, we're together and we break bread together. You know what breaking bread isn't communion in this case. It's about sharing a meal together. It's about more that band of brothers. And then you're an extreme makeover. You have a constant conversation with the Father and you keep it going in your own personal life but also together. What I've discovered about this, it says... 
It says that they were devoted to the apostles and to the fellowship. There was an and in there. See, I, they were devoted to the apostles. They were devoted to the Bible. They were devoted to God's word and the fellowship. Like, I think that's, like, I think we learn best in God's, God's word together. Like, we should have our own private devotions. We should be reading God's word daily, but we also should be in it with other believers. The, that, can, that, that and there means something. I think it's the same with the breaking of bread and prayer. Like, when we break bread, when we spend time together, we, we should pray alone, but we should also pray together. That's something I'm learning. That's something that, that is a struggle for me as a doer, is to take the time together jointly to pray. It... it, it Anybody else? Yeah, can we admit that? And that's where God wants to work because the church isn't to be disconnected from Jesus. And then look what happens. When we allow extreme makeover in our life, look, look what happens here. I don't want you to miss this. It says, Everyone was filled at all with the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And it says, The church this called out group of believers. It says they were enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, when the church is the church, when we've allowed extreme makeovers in our life and now we're living church the way God calls us to, putting our preferences aside, being together, the world wants what we got then the world wants what you and I have. And then the church gets to change lives. The church gets used by God. That's you and me to change the world. But if we don't get this right, and it's going to take a radical obedience to God to get that right. Just saying. We can't do it if it's just a side business. We can't do it if it's just one more thing we add to our plate. No. Repent and be baptized. Identify as a follower of Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to rearrange the furniture of your life. And then God is going to do extreme makeovers in your life. And when he does that, the world is going to stand in awe. They're going to, they're going to say there's something different about them. Can you imagine being a church that people say, I want that? Like they love each other. Like they're doing life together. They, they actually belong and they, they, they let each other belong. They let people belong before they believe. I want to go to that place. So what do you and I, if we're going to be for people and we're going to be for extreme makeovers, what are some steps we can take? Well, we've got to quit holding back. We've got to quit holding back. When I was first toying with the idea of whether I was going to follow Jesus or not, it was just plain, simple, too radical for me to go all in. I wasn't ready for that. He's going to, he's going to decide what I do with my money. He, he's going to decide what I say to my friends and where I go and what I do and how I act. And like I'm going to be doing these other things now, not these things. And, and it was just plain too radical for me. And so for a while, I kind of like did this. That's the worst of all worlds. Did you know that? that? That is the worst of all worlds. Go all in and see that God is for you. And he wants to do amazing things in your life and it will never happen if you just sort of try to tread in two worlds. Quit holding back. What's the idol in your life that keeps you from going all in with Jesus? Is it your comfort? Is it other people, what they might think of you? Is it, is it money? Maybe it's a certain pleasure you know God won't approve of. Maybe it's people's opinions. What is the idol that's holding you back? And what is it that God wants to do through you in someone's life right now? What would he do if you went all in? If you allowed him to do an extreme makeover in your life. And maybe you've begun to follow Jesus, been a follower of Jesus, but you've never elevated the Holy Spirit to control your life. You've set him in a side room and you've not let him rearrange the furniture. 
what would, where would God send you? Who would he Im- have you impact? And then be God's living letter. Do you know that every one of us is a letter from God? I'm going to close with this story. There, there was a guy named John Courier. This was back in the late 40s. I think it was 1949. He actually, he murdered someone. He was committed to jail. And he served a long sentence. At some point, they decided to pardon him, and they pardoned him to a farm in Tennessee, and he had to do hard labor there. Like, he was working the farm with his hand implements and all that. I mean, it was a, it, it felt hopeless, like it, it would just last forever, and there was no chance of freedom. And he was going on, but unbeknownst to him, after he had been pardoned and worked his farm for a while, they had actually, they had actually cut short his sentence like he was free but he didn't know it no one had sent him the letter no one had communicated that to him or to the system and so for for years he continued to work this hard labor in this farm feeling this sense of hopelessness and finally someone discovered what had happened and so they they got the proper documentation and, and the people, and they went and, and they released John from, from this place where he thought he was going to spend the rest of his life, and now he's free. And what strikes me about that is that he was in slavery. He, he was in bondage. He was living a life without hope, all for the want of a letter. I want us to understand this today. Every one of us, you and you and you and me, every one of us who've been made free in Jesus Christ, who've received the gift of forgiveness and now identify as a child of God, have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide and empower us and to move us. We're a letter from God to the world. That's what this is all about. But the letter goes unwritten unless you allow God to do an extreme makeover in your life. But once you do, and once we come together as the body of Jesus Christ, once we set our preferences aside, and once we decide that we're going to be art in the world, we're going to be for people, we're going to let them belong before they believe. We're going to let them be a part of us even before they deserve to be. And we're going to walk with them until they come to know who Jesus is. That's the kind of letter God is sending to the world. Some have said, how do we we change what's going on in our society? How, How do we fix this? I stand before you today and say we won't fix it. We just won't fix it alone with politics. We won't fix it alone with good deeds. We won't fix it alone with trying to think a certain way, we will fix it alone in the plan of Jesus Christ when we give ourselves fully to him and when, when God begins to see the church be the church that he created with the power he created, with the love that he created. And when we are four people that don't deserve it, like they're going to, God's going to give us favor with them. (laughs) And he's going to move their hearts. And they're going to come to know Jesus. And you and I will be the letter that goes to John. You and I, together, will be the letter that goes to the world and will bring them out of the hopelessness that they feel. That's why it's so important to be for people and to be focused on what we're for because for draws people together and against drives them away. Let's pray. Father, I just I, I pray for, for all of us that, that you would help us to take the step to, to identify with you, to trust completely in all that you have done, not in our own strength, not in our own abilities, to not have 10 other plans going, but to, but to be all in with you. And whatever you tell us to do, just to be devoted to what you want for our lives, to listen to you because we trust that you are for us. You're the one that started for, and you're for us, even though we don't deserve it. 
even though we have sin in our lives. You were for us before we deserved it. And you saw things in us. You created us to be a people of purpose and of great power and of, and of great use to your kingdom. And Lord, we pray that we'll live up to that. We pray that you'll fill us with your spirit. But Father, we pray that we'll be a letter, that we will invite people into our lives and before them, even when no one else is, that will allow them to belong before they subscribe to our, our beliefs and who you are, Jesus, and what you want to do for them. Lord, help us to be that kind of a people. Help us, Father, to be an extreme makeover that, that leads to other extreme makeovers. Help us to be your love letter to the world, a living letter. Father, we just thank you that you have given us this high call and you've called us to live to a high place. Thank you that you are for us. Lord, we're going to live that way. And we know it'll change everything. Thank you for who you are. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Man, go sign up to be in a life group. Go, go be part of a journey study, whether you lead one or whether you, you allow somebody to build into your life. Sign up for baptism and identify with Jesus. Identify with the church that God's created. Go take a step. Use your gifts, your financial resources, tithe, trust God. Let God use you for the common good. Go and change the world. Be the letter that God's called you to be.